What's up, everybody? We're here with Howdy. Aubrey and Whitney. We're talking about relationships today because they're in one. Yes, and, we are. Um, this we are. is for my podcast. Those of you that tuned in, whenever the hell that was, it's all a whirlwind now. When Yesterday. I was, when I was a guest on Aubrey's show, that was a different show. That was his podcast, which you should listen to. And when does yours come out? And what's it called? Within the month, hopefully. Within the month. And so it's called True Love and Wild Sex. And I'm doing it with <laughs> Dr. Wednesday Martin. Brad, True Love and Wild Sex, that is sure to be a hit. True Sex, true and, sex wild and Wild Love. love. Wait, what did yeah. I say? <laughs> true sex I was going to mix that. True, true Sex and, and wild, wild Love. Okay, yeah, cool. Because you're switching them. Yeah, I like both of those things. <laughs> What's untrue? <laughs> is untrue sex when you're not into it and you're pretending you are? That's called service sex. <laughs> <laughs> There's a term for that. Is there? Service sex. Oh, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. So where you're serving, like you feel like it's like you're going to a job. Like here I am laying down and just having sex again because I feel like I have to have sex with you and it's service sex. Yeah, the obligatory sex. It sucks to be on the receiving end of that type of sex. Probably almost as much as it does to be the one giving it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. Okay, welcome to the podcast, you two. You two thanks. crazy, sexy, horny kids. She whiz, <laughs> thanks. Those of you listening to the show here, uh, in case you fast forwarded through the intro, we are likely going to talk about some adult themed topics. So if you have youngins in the room, there could be some sex act or um, a, a vulgarity and um, you know cursing involved in this conversation. So be forewarned, you're now warned. Now we are free to say whatever we want. Woo <laughs> so, oh man, there's so much to talk about and I almost don't know where to start because you guys have such an interesting relationship and it's one that is very public because you're both kind of in the business of exploring your own consciousness, your own personal growth. And part of that is you sharing that as content, right? So I've not heard you talk about it as much, Whitney, but um, Aubrey being out there on the mic a lot, something he refers to a lot is the nature of your relationship and how it's evolved. And I just find it fascinating and I'm excited to dive into it. So, and I also just want to say, I'm not like pro or con any type of relationship. I'm into relationships that help people to grow and that are healthy for whatever their term is for that. Yeah, I agree. That's something that I say all the time. I'm not pro any type of relationship. I just want you to be in the relationship that you truly choose for yourself and that you're not entering into because somebody said you should do it or your friends are doing it or your parents are doing it or you feel like you just should do it. Like, let's create your most optimal relationship. That's perfect. Let's do that. Yeah, we have, there's so much conditioning out there. <clears throat> and to really be free, you have to unprogram all of that conditioning, that conditioning that says a relationship should look like this certain thing and be this certain way and be happily ever after and all the things that were subtly and overtly conditioned by, whether it's parental pressure or just tradition or just the public social pressure or the fairy tale stories or whatever it might be, but there's so much conditioning that to really look at it and choose whatever you're gonna choose that is absolutely the most important thing to make it a conscious choice so that you have agency and that you really have free will in your relationship and how long have you two been dating all in Seven i know there was a years. couple a couple years off there or something or, well we were hmm. together two years monogamous okay and then he wanted to be in an open relationship and i said absolutely not hell no <laughs> goodbye <laughs> um I'll, i was very sad i didn't say it that smoothly yeah. at all and then i went traveling for three months um, backpacking and we got back together after that and now we've been together for five open wow you've made it that far that's impressive so seven years total yeah when Aubrey's been on my show um, we've had conversations about it when you weren't present and he describes some of the inner growth and some of the demons that he's overcome and, and sort of contextualized the experience as using the relationship as a means by which to overcome some of those deep-seated insecurities and the things that come up when you're becoming vulnerable in ways that you are in a relationship and you, all of your instincts are crying out against losing that person, et cetera. And I've always thought like, man, I get the lessons, but damn, that's a fucking hard way to learn them, you know? <laughs> so I, I am excited to talk to you guys about the inner exploration and what, and what you've been through. So I think in most relationships um, that I've observed, including my own, when one person is like, hey, you know what? I think it's natural to be with maybe other people. Let's try this. It usually seems to be the guy. Do you, do you think that that's true based on other people that you all 
um, interact with? Actually, what I'm finding through my, because I do coaching for couples and individuals and relationship coaching, and a lot of it deals with um, a healthy way to open a relationship or have conversations around triggering subjects or challenging subjects. And I'm getting hit up a lot by mo- mainly females who are interested in opening the relationship. Really? Mm-hmm. Interesting. And the woman, Dr. Wednesday Martin, who wrote the book on True, is a great friend of ours. I'm starting a podcast with her. Her The studies are also showing that women are now the, the ones that are heading kind of the polyamory, polyamorous movement. That They're also the ones in the in the clinical research. If you look at the curve of boredom in the bedroom, you'll see the man's curve slowly kind of trickling down, and you'll see the woman's curve of boredom just falling off the cliff. Right? <laughs> really? Like, yeah. Women between are getting, one and three years. Women like, are getting Phew. bored in the aggregate way faster is, and way more intensely than men are. That's so hard for me to hear because my ego wants me to believe that <laughs> they obviously haven't been in a relationship with me. <laughs> I'm that kinky. changes when you meet me, baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. It'll be that, exciting forever. That that. But that it's in sucks. the public zeitgeist, right? Like it's in the idea of the man getting lucky. Like you right. see on every sitcom, every stupid sitcom, like, oh, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get lucky tonight because he bought a dinner or a diamond bracelet. It's like you almost have to purchase their sexual desire, right? Because I think subconsciously we understand that, oh yeah, like th- these women are getting bored. And so we've just adopted it into it. It's not because the men are terrible lovers. Maybe they are, but I think it's because we kind of know that women are getting bored, you know, more than the men. The men are eager to have sex. Yeah, I'm gonna get lucky. The women are like, yeah, okay, well, you bought me this thing, so I guess you will get lucky. Get lucky? That should never be how sex is. It should be like both of us getting lucky. Like, we, we get to have sex. This is the greatest ride of an incarnated body. Right. Wow. You, you know, know, I think it. I think you're right. As a, as a guy, I, I, I think that sex is framed as almost something that women do reluctantly as a favor to the guy as if we need it or want it more you know like oh i'm you know i'll <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna fuck you or give you a head or give you a hand job or whatever just to kind of pacify you because it's my duty and that's what guys need and that's what guys get out of the equation mm-hmm. in other words there's a transactional mm-hmm. sort of commerce base to a lot of i guess the western approach to sexuality that i've observed and i'm sure participated in to some degree going back to you the archetype of a date where you take a girl out to really expensive dinner and i just spent a hundred bucks like i better get an orgasm out of this deal <laughs> right i mean i think that's more common than we'd like to admit but is that really an evolved way to approach an interaction that can be of a higher consciousness whether you're in a, you know quote unquote committed relationship or not right it's like a tit for tat sort of thing which kind of takes a lot of the fun out of it yeah and i think a lot of that also comes from you know for a really long time female pleasure and the importance of pleasure and an orgasm for the woman has not been of the utmost importance it's always been about the guy and so it's like great he took me out to a dinner and i guess i'll have sex with him but i'm not going to be able to come Right. You know, and so right. even when it comes to any other dates or any sexual experiences, it's always a lot of emphasis on the man. And now I think times are changing, and obviously the studies are coming out showing a difference. But women, we have the that like our pleasure is amazing, and like we are able to. We have eight thousand nerve endings down there, and we also get lady boners every morning, just like men do. <laughs> what? Yes. Enlighten me, we please. We wake up. We have. J- the what is it we have the exact amount of erectile tissue as a man does just inner just inner wow yes wow that's interesting that you say that because i've often viewed this from an anatomy point of view and this is probably not just the way i view it but the way it is but it's it's almost like the vagina is just an inside out cock right and it (laughs) does i mean i've noticed on a good day it does get like tighter and swollen inside you know and i'm like what is that it feels awesome no matter what part of your body's touching it it's pretty cool to experience that but i never thought of it like as getting aroused in terms of an erection Mm -hmm. or blood flow going in there and doing that wow interesting yeah Yeah, people people think of the clitoris as that little tiny button but it actually goes way deep on it. It looks like through. a wishbone. It looks like a big like, wishbone. It, everyone go look up a 3D um, design of the female clitoris, and you're gonna be blown away if you don't know. Because this is not something that we're taught in school. Yeah. I had no idea until probably six months ago when I met Wednesday, and she brought this di- diagram or something for us, and 
I didn't like know what it was. Printed like clitters. a three D printed oh, clitoris. Oh, please! I'd, I'd like to <laughs> examine one of those. Yeah. I mean, I think when, as a guy, when you're younger, you're just literally like feeling around in the dark, hoping that the woman is into it and that you're able to please her. And I mean, I think most guys enjoy having the woman climax, but no one really teaches us that. I mean, my sex education did not involve like, hey, you should check out a diagram of a vagina. And well, mine didn't either, and I have the vagina. I literally <laughs> right, thought right. that my clitoris was just the button. Right. And for and I'm almost 30 years old. Right. And most people, I posted it on my Instagram and I said, do you guys know what this is? A lot of people had no idea what it was. And that is beyond me. There has to be something that changes here. And I think it is proper education of anatomy, but I also think it's proper education on what pleasure is and how to give pleasure to each other. Okay, so everyone I know that's ever read like The Ethical Slut, Sex at Dawn, these type of books, including myself comes to this realization where they go oh human beings aren't naturally wired to just pair bond with one partner and live happily ever after therefore these desires that i've been feeling to venture out of my relationship are natural and inherently good and i've been programmed by religion by society to think otherwise so I'm closer to a bonobo than I am a saint, right? So mm -hmm. this, and I went through this whole process too, like, oh, this totally explains it, no wonder. So now we need to have the discussion, like, can we be more bonobo-like in our relationship and venture out? And then there's, it's not only the societal things, but then there's the repercussions of the human instincts of jealousy and insecurities and all these things that that brings up which can be so painful in some cases where that, you know, our, our desire to be more natural and live in a state that's not in opposition to our biology actually ends up crushing us or the relationship because psychologically we just don't have the framework to handle that. So I, I, I can't have this conversation without being a little bit subjective in my own experience, having been someone for, I mean, if I started having sex in 1986 when I was 16, I'm 48 now. I've only been in a couple monogamous relationships voluntarily because I was just like, this is boring. I feel trapped. I feel stuck. Now, arriving at the place I am in my life and in my relationship, I mean, you know, things can evolve and change and who knows what the future will bring. But at this point in time, like I have zero interest in having sex with anyone other than my girlfriend. I'm Well, you might have broken the fever of that when you went celibate for, <laughs> right. for, for a few years. Right. You, know, you broke your bonobo fever. And totally. Now you're, now you're I, I think, and I, you know, I don't know how, how exactly to take this where I want to take it, but what I discovered for myself was, sure, there's an inherent desire to have variety, right? I don't want to just be with one partner for five years or 10 years. Like you want to have sex with 10 different women because it's going to be a different experience with each one and you're going to have a different type of intimacy and pleasure and all of that. But I think for me, a lot of it, having done some work on myself was using being promiscuous and finding the data to support that as a means by which to not truly open my heart and become vulnerable with one person. So it was like being very sexually active in order to be a love avoidant, to put it in more clinical psychological terms and be in a sense almost like sexually or not sexually, but maybe like love anorexic if you could make that term up. I don't know if it's a real thing. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's like, I, see what like you're I don't want to get, I don't want to get really close or intimate and really open my heart and be vulnerable. Therefore I just need to kind of like have those doors open. And then also the, you know, the instances of, childhood enmeshment and feeling overwhelmed or trapped by a parent and not ever wanting to be quote unquote trapped by a girlfriend or a wife so I need my freedom and where I actually ended up arriving at was that my interpretation of freedom was a bit shallow in my case because I never really had the true freedom to love fully mm -hmm. you know to be just totally seen and to see the other and to just completely be naked and open my heart up for the arrows that might fly as a result of that. So I'm arriving at this weird place where I'm looking at you guys in your relationship and I'm like, that seems fucking terrifying because <laughs> I'm finally at a place where I feel very safe being just open with one person and that container feels really comfortable and I don't feel trapped at all. I feel like I was trapped when I felt like I had to go have all these experiences because I was preventing myself from truly being open to that deep intimacy with one person. <clears throat> Does that make any sense no, to you guys in your own, sure. in your own journeys? It makes total sense. And I think the difference of what you're describing is you're talking mostly about not so much a polyamorous or, or committed open relationship. You're mostly talking about kind of being single. 
you know, like you're just kind of playing the field, being single, nothing's too deep. Everybody's kind of on the same level. Yes. It's a lot different story when you have a committed, deep, deep, deep partnership with somebody where the love is so strong and you allow them to be sexually free and you allow them to love others while still maintaining that deep love that you're describing. Right. Like, so that gives you that commitment, but then it also gives you that incredible challenge of, can I be committed with my heart still open while leaving my partner unpossessed, wild, free? You know? Jesus Christ. And this is something, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's the, it's that's not easy. This oh, is what I say, man. like if somebody's thinking, hmm, I wanna try an open relationship, it's probably gonna be hard. Okay, if you think it's gonna be hard, times that by like 100 and then you're getting close. <laughs> right. Like it's very challenging. But I was similar to you to where I would be with multiple people and I would never let them close enough in. Um, about a year, year and a half, I'd wake up bored out of my mind and there was nothing wrong with the person I was laying next to other than my own blocks and my own fears and my own insecurities. And what helped me break that was this open relationship because it highlighted all of that. And I don't think I would be as open as I am today or nor know myself as much as I know today without being in an open relationship. And I think you can get there multiple ways just like you did. For me, this is the way that it really shed light on all of my shit. Um, and you have to constantly work for it. And so now for me, I'm the most open that I've ever been in my entire life because of this type of relationship. Wow, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. that's and it's interesting. actually something else that was really interesting for me that people think is, they don't put the two and two together is m my whole life growing up, I was always very competitive with women. And I feel like we are, we're taught about, we're taught that. We're supposed to be competitive. We don't want to steal my man. We don't want them to have the better purse. We don't want them to drive the better car or be prettier right, or more right. younger or whatever it is, have right. the better body. And that was always my mindset growing up. So coming into this relationship, you would think it would make me more competitive with other females. Um, when in reality, all it did was force me to have the difficult conversations and look at my shit and then look at theirs and us come together and be vulnerable with each other because vulnerability is what creates the connection anyways. Right. Um, and so now I have a girl tribe that is incredibly deep and open and fun and loving and supportive. Be and I think it, a lot of that has to do with just through the open relationship and, and seeing that. And many of Whitney's friends were my former lovers, my ex-fiance, my ex, the first mm -hmm. lover that I had, the you know, other different people I've had romantic connections with are Whitney's, you know, a lot of Whitney's closest inner circle of friends. Wow. And I think that's, yeah. that is, that's the, <laughs> so that, <laughs> you guys are next level. But that makes it, that actually makes it the most virtuous and healthy because I think right. that actually is our biological design is yeah. that we share within the tribe. So the fact that these women are part of her tribe, it makes the whole thing a lot easier. And it makes But let it, me just say, it's, that's not how it first started. Yeah. Well, we're you know, gonna go there. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. because I, I can't, I don't wanna get anybody the idea yeah. that I just like floated through this and was super <laughs> close friends with all of them. I was like, nah, I don't like you. Mm -mm. We're, it I, took a while. I'm reverse engineering this. Okay. Because I'm just, <laughs> I'm trying to get my head around it because I feel really contented in my life right now in this way and I, I don't wanna rock the boat. Like I'm good, I figured out, I think what works for me at this point. But I'm also deeply curious about what works for other people and I'm, deeply committed to evolving myself also. So when I observe someone else growing in a different way, I just, I'm driven to learn about that and share that with the listeners of the show. Which I love because I feel like this is one, or I know that this is one topic that can be incredibly triggering and incredibly fascinating. Um, and I think because humans are so, we're adaptable, adaptable beings and we try to put it ourselves in other people's shoes. And so that's why it's so triggering because they're thinking like, what if I did this in my relationship? Or what if my husband did this? Or what if I said that? And it's like, let's just see and talk about it from just an open perspective um, because there's so much that can be learned from like techniques and communication and things that we've done that will only benefit a strictly monogamous relationship. Yeah, okay, so leaving apart the side in the beginning before you guys had the break when Aubrey's like, hey, I want it to be open, you're not having it. When you guys reconvene, at what point do you both decide 
let's create a container of a relationship that allows exploration outside of the relationship. So when you got back together, did you both simultaneously agree to that or did that evolve after you, you know, re re merged with one another? Well, it was already like an understanding. I knew for, for Aubrey, he's the type of person that when he understands something logically, he will put it into practice very quick. And I'm not, like that as much. It takes me longer to move through things. So I knew when I was traveling that this was a type of relationship that he wanted and that was what he was going to create. There was no going back to a monogamous relationship. Right. So when I was traveling, I met, well I didn't meet, it was actually one of his really good friends and he was super hot, beautiful smile <laughs> and we totally hit it off. And that was the point to where I realized, oh, I can be attracted to somebody else and want to explore that and have some fun, but still very much so love Aubrey and still want to be with him and he has my heart. So when I came back, that's when we decided, okay, he, you know, he was like, I still wanna be with you, I still really wanted to be with him, but he was already seeing somebody else. And so we were, if we were going to get back into a relationship with each other then it was under an open relationship container. Right, right, okay. So in a sense, he kind of went first the second time around. Well, because we both kind of we, went at the same time because she was hooking up with one of my best friends. <laughs> while yeah, she was we were split up. Yeah, we yeah, yeah, together. yeah, I, I understand. Yeah. yeah. Well, these are, the, these are those social norms that, you know, I don't know where they come from. I think they come from a, probably a wholesome place of not wanting to hurt other people. And I think where I've arrived at in, in my journey is just, I don't want to, I don't want to do something that would make my lover or girlfriend or wife or whatever uncomfortable and cause them pain. And if that means like not strain out of the relationship because that is not cool with them, then I'm cool with that. And I'm hoping I'm with someone that feels the same way. And mm -hmm. even though they might have ideas, they're like, you know what? It's not worth it. We have a great thing going. But the other side of it is what you're describing is the deeper level of understanding and compassion is being with someone and caring about them enough. We let them do whatever the fuck they want. You know, which is kind of the the other end of the spectrum. It's true. It's true. How you would be with a best friend, right? Or how you would be with a sibling. Like you know, it's like, yeah, fucking. Are you, do you have a great time? Yeah, awesome. I'm so happy about. It. Tell me about it. What happened? Awesome. You know, like it's possible to be really rooting for your partner, right? In the same way that you would root for someone that you're not attached to, that you're not looking at a mirror back at yourself and saying, am I the best lover? Am I the worthy man? Am I the worthy woman? Am I the hottest? Am I the blah, blah, blah? You know, like we don't do that with our best friends or we shouldn't at least or our siblings and we shouldn't at least, you know, and that's, that is to me, like everybody says, oh yeah, I married my best friend. I'm like, really? Because there's different rules that you have for your best friend. You really root for your best friend to have the best time possible always. <laughs> but do you really do that with your, right. with your girlfriend, wife, right. you know, husband? Right. Like, I don't think so. You know, there's different conversations you have with the boys or different conversations the girls have. You're not even being fucking honest with each other. And you're saying that you're with your best friend? Like, okay. Right. Let's take a look at that. Let's take a real good look at that. So there's see. a lot of social norms and assumptions. You know, when, when you're talking about her going off and finding this attraction, eventually having some degree of intimacy with your best friend, I mean, you're a guy, you know, this is against code. Mm. Like, I would not like, you know, outside of this conversation and the fact that I have a girlfriend and all that, like just as even though we're more acquaintances, Aubrey, we haven't hung out much socially. It's been more of a professional kind of casual relationship. Knowing you two have dated, I would never, ever hit on her because it's bros before here's the, here's the thing, Luke, females. Here's the thing. You know, you know what? You know what I've realized is that the closer I am with someone, the easier it is for me to enjoy Whitney being with them. Wow. Like, because that is, if it's some stranger, it, this is the example that I always use, a classic example. Let's say I have a Lamborghini, right? Whitney's my Lamborghini. Now, if I have a really close friend who wants to give it a ride and drive around in it, yeah, hey man, here's the keys, go for it. I trust that he's not gonna fucking smoke in the car, he's not gonna run into curbs, and if he does, he's gonna tell me, he's gonna, he's gonna like respect it, and, I, and I'm happy that he's gonna get to enjoy the car, even if he's putting miles on it, whatever, you know? So there's love for the person who's actually enjoying the thing that I love, the thing that's precious to me. And so that actually makes it easier on both sides, but we think it makes it harder because we know them. So we wanna like not look at it, but it's way easier when you can love both sides of the equation and be happy for both, in this case, Whitney and the person that she's with and be like, oh, I'm glad that Whitney's having a good time and I'm glad that my homie's having a good time too, like double win. 
Whereas if it's a stranger, you're like, I wonder what the fuck is happening. I wonder what he's thinking. I wonder what ideas he might be planning. I wonder if he's playing seductive games. I wonder if blah, blah, blah. I wonder if he's going to leave her healthier, wholer, you know, more inspired than when, when he found her. You know, you start, to, you start to have these questions. Your mind creates these stories and assumptions around that person because you just don't know them. You don't know their character or their morals or their values or anything. Right now at this moment, and you know, you can answer this or not. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm getting the sense you guys talk about this, so you can you know, feel free to answer how you wish. But like right at this moment, how many other people are you having sex with each on a regular basis? One. I have one have for the one. past year. One other. Okay. I have one consistent lover, and yeah. then I have one other, uh, one other lover that I see every once in a while yeah that's not too crazy that sounds reasonable no people think it's like a free-for-all like we're out there just having sex with anybody and everybody and it's orgies and one night stands constantly but it's like no it's not how it is at all like i said i've been with one person who i have a, a incredibly deep connection with for a year yeah this is this is interesting because again reflecting back to my own experience because it's the only way i can kind of get my head around this at the point I've arrived in life now, the idea of being sexual with someone that I don't know very well is completely not appealing. Whereas there was a time in my life, the less I knew someone, the better. <laughs> and the faster we could get to it, the better, you know, cause that's just how I'm wired sexually. I'm, I'm just good to go anywhere, anytime. Now it's like when I arrived in Austin, I was in Whole Foods and I'm checking out and I looked over and I was like, whoa, attractive woman. And now I have a girlfriend and I'm, you know, I'm not, it's really easy for me to not date or flirt with other people or it's the agreement we have. But for a second, I was like, oh, attractive woman. There would have been a time when I probably would have went over there and hit on her and see if I could get laid while I'm in Austin. Why not? And I looked over and I was just like, kind of had that thought of what it used to be like. And I thought, oh God, no, I really don't want to be naked in a room with someone that I don't know, Mm -hmm. which is such a weird experience to have because I've never really been that way. So if you, Aubrey, you know, you have a part-time and then a, a little more consistent and you have a regular lover, how much love and intimacy are present in those other relationships or are they relinquished to just like outside booty call status and then you two have the intimacy and the bond and the love or can the love and intimacy extend into those other explorations? I mean, for us personally, the love and the intimacy can extend to the other partners and, they, and it certainly does. And I, But I also think that that changes from relationship to relationship from situation to situation but we have the agreement that it's yes that is something that is okay and supported and i think it's natural and i think the having the idea that you're gonna have consistent sex with somebody but the emotions aren't going to get involved i don't think it's realistic see that's where i I arrived i don't don't think there's any part of human nature that that makes sense for (laughs) and like and love is love is wild like it can't be really contained it can't be stopped you can't put up some bullshit fence that's going to stop the love positive radiation from blasting straight through that fence it's like putting up a fucking saran wrap around chernobyl and being like no it's contained it's for sure contained well it's It's like 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 somebody (laughs) but don't like somebody too much yeah and it's just how do you do that it's just not possible so that's that becomes a really interesting challenge because as the relationship onboards there's a lot of a lot of connection a lot of presence a lot of focus a lot of obsession a lot of this stuff that will come on board and it takes a lot of experience was what we're learning to have the grace to allow that and the communication to understand that and to really give permission you know from a very conscious aware place to allow that love to take its course knowing that that love may supplant the amount of time the amount of resources the amount of attention that's available but having the grace to allow that if that's in the highest good and then on both sides just tracking what's happening and then communicating it as efficiently and effectively as possible and we've fallen on our face a hundred times you know with all of these different at least (laughs) yeah with all of these different different ways that we've had to deal with it but you know fundamentally it's i think we've both arrived at the conclusion that it is absolutely possible to deeply love more than one person at the same time just like a mother can love more than one child at the same time you know like love is not something that has to be given just to one it can be experienced in the wild when you open your heart to whoever you're with and the great mystics will say that you can love everybody that way that the sun does not you know decide which people that it shines on the rose does not decide which people gets its scent you know it's just loves 
it's just is love right and i think this is a way to to know that even though there are select people that get that get it but you start to understand that this love is a universal force that is in absolute abundance i think what you described in terms of at at a certain point being incapable of having that kind of intimacy we intimacy with someone in an ongoing basis and not have that love you know be the chernobyl that explodes past the cellophane mm-hmm. i've had that experience absolutely thinking you know trying to put parameters on okay no sleepovers that used to be mm-hmm. my thing like we can have sex you're not fucking spending the night because i'm protecting you girl you know <laughs> really i'm just like don't fall in ter- love with yeah me. i'm like terrified <laughs> of getting, i'm terrified of getting hurt is what the truth is and have some moral compass where i don't want that person to get attached when i know i'm an unavailable guy right but at a certain point i think as someone evolves, especially doing spiritual work and some of the things that I've done, is specifically kundalini yoga, which is a very heart opening. This is pre ayahuasca, which is another, of course, hugely heart opening experience. But at a certain point in my journey, I would try to have just like no strings attached, casual sex, and I literally I couldn't do it because I would start to get feelings, and I'm like, what? Am I turning into a high school girl? I remember when <laughs> I was always on the other end of that, where they're like, I'm starting to like you. I'm like, no, no, we mm-hmm. talked about this. We're just chill, you know. Netflix and chill. And then I'm the one all of a sudden that's like, I'm getting bonded to people that I'm aren't necessarily a, and no offense to anyone I've dated or had sex with that this happened with, but weren't necessarily appropriate long-term partners. They were fun sexual partners. We talked about it. We were adult about it. We were mature. We were totally honest, had integrity. And then I'm like, dude, my heart is too open. And it started to actually become emotionally painful to withhold that love. And I think that's why eventually I arrived at, hmm, maybe that more traditional kind of relationship that I always avoided is more my speed at this particular point because I want to be free to have that um, fully open heart. Now, what you guys are talking about is moving into a phase where you still have that truly open heart and also you can have an open heart for other people too, right? Right. And if you have sex with the same person too often, likely one of you are going to sprout feelings And then that's a whole other entity to deal with. Mm -hmm. And people say like, you're going to catch feelings. Like you're going to catch the flu. God, no, please (laughs) don't catch feelings. You know, that is so normal to, we're emotional beings. It's normal to catch feelings and have these feelings. And it's beautiful. And I think with you saying, you know, I went through this process to where you understood, okay, this might be a little bit too much for me, where I can fully open my heart in a strictly monogamous relationship right now. And you made the decision, you made the conscious choice to say, okay, I want to be in this monogamous relationship. Whereas most of, most of society is just born into a monogamous relationship, regardless if it works or not. And they're not even choosing it. Well, I I think, you know, I tried a lot of different arrangements of all types that don't, you know, necessarily bear going into, but I experimented with all of it, you know, within, at least within the heterosexual realm, you know, like all sorts of different arrangements and agreements and, you know, all sorts of crazy shit. I just would love for more people to do exactly that. Yeah. Just try it out. Try it on. If it doesn't work, don't do it. If you like it, keep it. Well, you know what really fucked that up for me was reading a book by Neil Strauss called The Truth. I don't know if you've read read it. I read a little bit of that, yeah. Yeah, and he goes, I mean, we're similar age. We've had many parallels in terms of, you know, issues that we've had with intimacy and being kind of closed off and just doing a lot of, you know, having a lot of sex and all that stuff. And then he has this experience in the book where he cheats on his girlfriend, just de- or maybe were they married yet? No, I think just girlfriend Ingrid and devastated her, totally fucked up. So he goes off on all these different, you know, goes to sex rehab and then tries poly relationships and all these different things. And then, you know, I'm just gonna uh, spoiler alert if you haven't read the book, here's how it ends, guys. Sorry about that, but it's pertinent to the story. At the very end, he realizes like, you know what? I kind of just love my life and I, my wife, and I just want to be with her. That's then, the end of the book, but yeah. that's not the end of the book. Well, it's not. It's not the end of his, his experience. Well, yeah. now they've since broken up. But I mm-hmm. read that book at a time when I had just, a relationship just ended largely because I was unable to meet my partner where she was ready in terms of heart opening and commitment. And she finally got sick of it and was like, I, I'm not going to wait around for you. I'm into you, but dude, like grow up kind of thing. And so it was very painful when I read that book. I was like, fuck, Neil's already tried everything. I've ever tried anything. What's the one thing I haven't tried? And that is a real chill, safe container of a healthy relationship, Mm -hmm. you know? And so (laughs) it's sort of a full circle thing for me, I think at this point. And it's very interesting hearing your guys' take where 
you're saying there is this there's a never ending supply of love so if whitney gives some of her love to another partner and they're bonded in a similar way that that doesn't mean that you're losing yours Oh, but it feels like it though. Yeah, that's what I'm God saying. God damn, it feels like it. Because it's crawling on the ground, vomiting, <laughs> crying, thinking you might not even make it. How am I going to see the sunrise this next day? Because I don't think I'll make it through this night. Right. It's that kind of shit. But the love's still there. Right. It hasn't actually gone anywhere. At the root of human jealousy, which I think is kind of natural and normal and to some degree healthy i mean obviously if you act on it and you're a tyrant of a partner and controlling and jealous freak not that but i mean i think when you're bonded to someone that if there's a threat of losing them to another partner that's a very real threat and it could break your heart if whitney falls kind of for lack of a better term more in love with this other partner and then she's like eh, aubrey not so much like that's a real risk that you're willing to take. It's a real, it's a it's real a, temporary reality. Well, right. it's a real risk for any sort of relationship. Right. Okay. Right. I mean, it's just as much as I could fall in love with somebody, you could fall in love with somebody. You know, I'm putting myself out there more. So yeah, I have a, probably quote unquote a bigger chance for that. But in my opinion, if your partner is is with somebody and they meet them on different levels, or for them, it's serving their life. It, better than you are at that point then why not why would you want them to not do that you know it's like no you have to be with me you're stuck with me when it's like man if they're really supposed and like meant to be with somebody and it feels better for them to be with somebody then support that and love them in that and yes it will hurt for sure but you can get through it have and you, you will have either of you ever had a situation in which someone i was going to call it like your side piece that's very disrespectful mm -hmm. the other people in the periphery of your individual relationships wants to take you for themselves like a woman you're you're with is like you know what fuck this open thing aubrey i don't want you seeing whitney anymore have, have those situations happened? i don't think it's ever been like that direct but yeah for sure right where the yeah. other person <laughs> thinks they can hang oh this is all fun very new agey like free love vibe mm -hmm. and then they're like no i can't deal fuck yeah but this. they're true but they're true desire is to be in a either monogamous or in a primary pair bond with one of us and that that creates a disturbance you know and so you have to be mindful of that because if someone's mind knows the rules of the game that allows the game to continue and i call it a game it's not a game it's very real it's very a lot of love there but if it allows the structure to continue by saying a certain amount of things like oh yeah i'm cool with this like i'm happy you know just seeing you as when i see you and we'll enjoy it but you can tell that every moment there's resentment building and there's a desire and, and an anger building. You have to you have to recognize that and you have to like bring that out into the open and be like, hey, I hear what you're saying, but this is what I'm feeling. You know, and I'm feeling something different and that will create discord if you're really listening and you're really paying attention. And, you know, that's a that's a challenge. You know, it's a real challenge. It's not only communication because we can learn how to communicate in a way that keeps the thing going, but it may not be the truth. It may not be expressing the most radical truth that's inside of us. And it can go both ways. It can go from the other partners or it can go from the primary partners. It can be like, hey, I'm not okay with the way that this relationship has been onboarded and going and the, and the distribution of time and resources. Like, I'm not okay with this anymore. So if you would like that and that to continue, I love you always, but I'm going to have to step out. Has that happened? That has happened. Yeah. Mm. Where it's getting a little too imbalanced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whitney's over here too much. And you're like, yo, hello, we're supposed to be. Coming. Yeah. And I thought, you know, I thought I could have the grace to step back enough to just enough, enough, enough grace to just allow and allow and allow. And but then I realized that I had backed past my point because my love was too deep and my commitment was too deep. I'd backed past the point where it was fun for me when it was worth it for me so I had to have a chat with Whitney and this was if people read my newsletter this is where I said you know Whitney and I almost split up because mm -hmm. at that point I said hey Whit I love you and I really respect your relationship with Ricky your boyfriend but this is the ante I just got jealous for you. This is, yeah. I was like, <laughs> like, just when you said your boyfriend, I'm like, fuck uh, yeah, Ricky. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, Where's this motherfucker? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, man. So, yeah, I basically had to say this is, the, this is the ante of the type of commitment and the type of presence that right. I want if I want to continue this relationship. And, you know, that was the moment where Whitney had to really 
kind of reflect on both the conscious and subconscious processes that were kind of moving. And I don't want to speak for you in that process, but it's been a pretty dynamic shift for the positive in, um, in having that discussion. Mm -hmm, for sure. And, and what have the different, for lack of a better term, sets of rules been and how have those rules evolved? Like, for example, you guys are having movie night together and your lover Ricky texts you and you're laying <laughs> with Aubrey and you're like, you know what? Yeah, I'd like to go fuck Ricky right now. Bye, honey. <laughs> Movie's over. I mean, you know, is there a rule against that or... I think there, well, is that we've never that done that or been in that situation. I think when we're like together, we're together. That's one of our rules is like presence in a relationship is huge. Like the biggest right. thing that you can give somebody is just being fully present. Um, and so I don't think we would be in a situation to where that would happen at all. Um, when we first started this open relationship and what I find a lot with the couples that I work with is they want to place all of these rules onto it so many rules to make them feel safer and control the situation. And I think having healthy and effective boundaries is great because it can help you. It's kind of like bumpers. You understand, you can stay in your lane a little bit. You understand it a bit. Um, but then as you go through being in an open relationship and kind of removing the layers and understanding it a bit more, you start to remove some of the rules and some of the, okay, you can't talk to them after 7 p.m. Okay, you can only see them on Wednesday. Okay, you can't hang out with friends. You can't go to our date night. You start to remove some of those rules and you get down to really the, what's the most important and that's, are we respecting each other? Are we showing up for each other? Are we working towards the same mission? Are we present when we're with one another? And so it's getting down to like the real nitty gritty foundational boundaries. Right, so some of the more nuanced, like do this, don't do that, when, where rules start to fade, start away, to fade away, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a, a more global sense of the relationship where mm -hmm. you just feel out the parameters and you kind of eventually know kind of what he's cool with and vice versa and you just, it's, and it's, it's a bit more about, malleable and it's communicated And it's about. communicated. If there is something that we just don't know, hey, are you, like, are you okay with me going somewhere at this certain time? Um, and he's like, mm, maybe not. Or yeah, sure, it totally works with our schedule. You know, so it is, everything is, when it comes to this type of relationship, everything is talked to death. Mm, like there's mm -hmm. so, there has to be a very, very, very high level of transparency. Um, otherwise it, it hurts because it, yeah. it's like truth slapping you in the face all of a sudden because you didn't see it to begin with. Yeah. What I like, the, the metaphor that I like to use is when truth is current, it's like you're riding together and it can be a storm, but you're, you're kind of both hands are pressed together because you're you and your, your truth with your partner is the same. So you can move through really choppy waters or bumpy roads or whatever, but you're pressed together and you'll handle whatever's going on at the same time. But if you allow a gap of truth, then as soon as you hit a bump, smack, smack, whatever, however that gap of truth, however long it's been, you know, as soon as you hit that bump, You'll, and you have to smash back into truth because one of the people can sense that something's off or something's up or something hasn't been expressed, then that slap is really, really painful. Whereas it can be hard, the bumps and the turbulence can be hard, even if you're riding together with truth, but not nearly as painful if, if you allow that truth gap to exist and then you crash back into truth together. So really it's a, a practice in staying current with the truth. And that means staying current with your own truth too. And that's, uh, that's hard to do because we have so many internal forces that are driving us towards certain things. You know, so the desire to be with someone could be an avoidance of, you know, it could be a fear of, of losing your partner currently. You know, like it might be a defensive move. Like you might be, I might be looking to go find another girl because I'm afraid that Whitney's gonna leave me. And that desire is like, so you have to be current with your own motivations and desires and drives and what's actually happening. Um, and that's hard. And bringing so. that into awareness, you know, like first and foremost, if you want to be in an open relationship or you want to explore something like this, it is a commitment to yourself. It's a commitment to yourself to look at your shadows and shed light on your shadows. If you want to do that, then you can venture down this path. If you don't want to do that, then I encourage another type of relationship. Yeah, yeah keep swallowing that blue pill. Not, know, keep, not, keep, not for keep the living in the hurt. matrix, you know? <laughs> I think the key to this is 
like I said earlier, people like you that are willing to kind of, you know, take the arrows and take the criticism or judgment from people at large that maybe don't agree with your particular lifestyle and also saying, listen, we're not advocates. People ask us questions, we're willing to answer. Yeah. But this is like what you're saying, Aubrey, is that that open dialogue and open communication and that honesty where you're having that sense of intimacy where not only is there not deceit going on, you're not hiding things from one another, but you're saying, whoa, there's interesting, there's something coming up within me here. Mm. Let me explore that, see if I can articulate it, get clear about what it is, and then not wait around for that tension to build and to get more murky waters, but to say, hey, listen, I need to bring something to the table. Mm. And I mean, that is so crucial for any kind of relationship dynamic as mm -hmm. I'm currently learning right now. It's like, I call it a disturbance in the force. And I can tell when something's off within myself and also with my partner. And 99.9% yeah. .9 of the time I'm right. It might not be a big deal. It might just be a little something that was said by one of us and didn't sit right. Or it might be like a bit more of an existential question that needs to be addressed you know an area of compatibility or something if it's a long-standing partnership and you've let's say that you have a history and a pattern of sussing something out that hasn't been communicated right at that point your fear your fear center your amygdala is going to be on high alert for that and you're going to be perceiving subtle is something going on what's going on you yeah, know if, if you've been rewarded yeah. if you've been rewarded for your like psychic perceptions about what's going on it's going to be a problem so you have to be mindful that like the more that you can keep in truth and then the more practice you build with that, then the more that both people can relax and, and like really relax. Yeah, right. and for me particularly, I and I think a lot of people can relate to this, I've always had a, it's always been challenging for me to have these vulnerable conversations and speak my truth and speak my emotions because I never really did that growing up and I never really used my voice and so this type of relationship forced me to do that and it wasn't always easy and I would come into conversations and I would be like tiptoeing around like um so uh and like just very anxious <laughs> right. and it was just so awkward right. um because I didn't want to like hurt Aubrey I knew it was going to cause a little bit of an emotional reaction in some way and that was challenging for me plus that's one of my you know my practices that I need to practice is, is using my voice and speaking my truth. Um, and it's just keeping that in mind in any relationship. If there's something that comes up for you where you realize, okay, this feels really uncomfortable. I'm too afraid to have this conversation. Then use that as your guiding star because that's like the exact conversation that you need to have. And I, my recommendation would be to start off with your feeling, you know, like, Hey, I'm feeling sad or I'm feeling jealous or I'm feeling upset whatever it is because then you're coming with your vulnerable feeling and you're not pointing your finger at your partner you made me feel this way no 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 it's like I'm feeling jealous because this is what happened you know can we talk about this oh that's amazing that's so fucking good what you just said right there thank you for that I I, I mean it took me a while I had to learn that <laughs> I mean I just I relate to all of that so much and and also the not only the problem of that but the solution of that and so many conflicts can be short circuited and like detangled just by that vulnerability. But mm -hmm. it's also the the least intuitive way to go about it because of course defense and offense is the go-to. Mm. You know, fucking hurt them before they hurt you, defend, be prepared and all of that when just going in and be like, cool, go ahead and put an ax through my heart right now. This is what I'm feeling. I'm just gonna be honest with you and admit it. And I swear to God, anytime that I do that in relationships, the conflict is almost immediately resolved yeah. because the person's like, oh shit, you have a heart. I care about that heart. I'm going to now have the capacity to listen to what you're saying and share your experience. Mm -hmm. But it's really counterintuitive. I mean, maybe more so for men, I think too. Yeah, it takes Sweetie, practice. can I talk to you? Like, I'm kind of having some feelings. I mean, you feel, you feel like such a chode doing that. <laughs> you know, it's just like, oh God, I can't believe I'm being this honest. Mm about what my experience is. And I, I think, you know, thankfully, if you're if you're with someone conscious, they can meet you there and be like, oh shit, like we need to really hold this delicately so we can continue to communicate without those defenses going up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of the work of um, Sue Johnson? Mm -mm. Yeah, she talks a lot about a lot a lot about this type of communication. It's really cool stuff. So- And when you said, you said something that, um, you said something, hold this delicately. And I wanna, I wanna, make sure that I, that I, 
you know, kind of clarify what delicately means, because I think all too often we try to be delicate thinking that we're going to help somebody, but a delicate is really our way of marketing and really our way of spinning the truth to, to ameliorate it, to soften it, to make it something that it's not, oh, I'm going to be delicate with their feelings. So I'm not going to say actually what's going on instead of saying like, I love my boyfriend or I love, I'm, you know, I'm kind of starting to develop some feelings and that's delicate. But it's false. And it's manipulative. Right. And it's manipulative. Right. And it's ultimately going to create so much more pain because it brings you out of trust and then it brings you into doubt, which brings you into fear, which brings you into separation, which then ultimately has to crash back together or completely go apart. Right. So be mindful of being delicate and really commit, commit, commit to truth. Radical honesty. Radical yeah. truth. And yeah. truth, truth is kind. Truth yeah. is always kind. It's the kindest thing you can do. Like if you're wondering what's the kindest thing to do, it's truth. Right. Always. Right. And that you just have to have the longest term perspective and understand that some stresses are going to be hormetic. Some are going to, if you give the truth, they're going to have to deal with it now, but that's good. That's what's supposed to happen. Right. And so like trust that the most delicate, sensitive thing that you can do is to be the most honest. And that doesn't mean project your thoughts about the other person. That means just be true with what you're feeling, true with what you're experiencing. And, you know, that is kind. And if you're bringing that truth to, because that was something that I had to work on a lot was, like you said, not hurting the other person. I know if I say this, it might cause an emotional reaction. Or I don't want to hurt them. Um, and so when it came to me seeing somebody else or wanting to see somebody else or saying that I love Ricky, um, it caused like an emotion. I knew it would be challenging for him, but we're asking this from each other. And so it's like, it's basically saying like, I respect you enough and I know that this is what you want and I want to be able to give you this, that I know that you can handle this. Like I'm giving you the opportunity to show up instead of saying, oh no, no, sweetheart, you can't handle this. So I'm not going to tell you the truth and I'm going to withhold it or I'm going to say it in a different tone to manipulate you. So you're doing coaching now with people that are interested in, you know, following in your footsteps, so to speak. W what books do you guys read? What experts do you study? If any, do you go to therapy, couples counseling? How are you learning the shit you're talking about in terms of mm -hmm. being able to communicate in these ways and having those skills? I mean, those skills, you're not just born with that shit. I certainly was not. Most, born you know, with we it. don't we don't learn it from our parents. I mean, we learn all kinds of dysfunctional patterns that then we spend the rest of our lifetime kind of unraveling. So, where where do you guys go to learn about this shit? How to communicate without getting triggered and pissed and blaming and being defensive and offensive? Who who are your go tos if you have them? Uh, first and foremost, it was just us, like putting ourselves in the lab and testing this out on ourselves. So, a lot of the you know, coaching that I do comes from straight experience and putting myself on the fire for everybody and, and trying to undo my programming and look at my shadows. And so for me, that has been one of the biggest lessons. It's not just reading a book. It's like I'm actually putting myself in there. Um, plus, I do a lot of studying and I like to just cram with knowledge. And I love Tammy Nelson. Um, the Ethical Slut is a great book. Untrue Wednesday Martin is great. Dr. Chris Ryan, Sex at Dawn. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Well, and then the spiritual and the more the spiritual, spiritual books, like reading Ram Dass and reading Don, Ma the Don, Ma Don Miguel Ruiz, Mastery of Love. And then reading this new book, Awareness by Anthony DeMello, has really just completely, you know, escalated and advanced my own worldview about owning really my own you know attitude towards all my feelings and understanding that everything is happening internally and it's not an external cause and understanding these things that help us communicate and so it is a combination of that plus we've had some help we've had dr dan engel who's a psychiatrist and had experience with open who's been guiding us through the path as well. And that was extremely, That's extremely helpful. helpful. Having somebody, this is why I got into coaching because we were constantly being asked about what do we do? How does this work? What do you do with jealousy? Blah, blah, blah. And we had Dan, thank God, because we would get in, we were in full crisis mode when we would call him instead of using him like preventatively, which is probably the best way to do it. Um, so that's why I got into coaching was because because I wanted to be there for people who were looking for resources. And there's not a lot of therapists out there. There are some great ones, but there's not a lot who are, you know, understand the open lifestyle and whether they say it or not, they can it can dictate how what kind of advice they give you if they don't fully understand it even if they don't live it or not it'd be like be it'd be like trying to learn from a fight coach who'd never been in a fight 
you know, like hadn't been in mixed martial arts fight, did a couple Taekwondo matches when they were young, you know, like if you're, this is full MMA, you know, this is all the rules. <laughs> no this is taking to the mat, jujitsu, <laughs> kickboxing. This is all of the arts and all of the things put together. And, you know, if you're going to learn just being with one sensei who's only studied one style and only does, you know, Shotokan and that's all you're learning from, it's not going to be really, you're not going to really learn and really, they're not going to really know even what advice to give you because they haven't been through it. They haven't walked the walk. So I think that's the perspective that, you know, Whitney and I are hoping to offer is, you know, we've been in these, we've been in the, in the, in the ring, in the octagon for, you know, for these five years and we've gotten both KO'd a million times, you know, and got it wrong a million times and then learned and got it right. And then had the guidance, applied the guidance and applied the learnings and the teachings from both the spiritual masters and the sexual research and the relationship counseling and, and all these different things. So in total, you know, we've learned, we've learned a lot and we've advanced a lot and- And we still know, fuck up, we you still know, do. like we're human and who, all of you guys are listening are human. You're going to make mistakes and that's okay. Just learn, you, you can just learn from it. Yeah, how many people get out of an MMA fight, a really intense fight without some blood on their face? You know, it's like you don't fight a perfect MMA fight, rarely you do. Most of the time you get fucking hit and you get you get beaten and you get knocked down and if you're going to stay in it you get back up you know what i mean and and sometimes sometimes you have to submit for a while sometimes you have to tap sometimes you have to surrender and take a space and come back again but like to think that you're going to do this like a uh, just a ninja. I really thought I was kind of cocky. I thought like I, I had this understood <laughs> philosophically and I was going to get through this relatively unscathed. Right, right. Oh man, did was I wrong? Yeah. Like I had no idea how much this was going to crush me. Do you think this is any more or less difficult um, of a storm to weather based on your patterns of trauma? Like, I, you know, I don't know that much about each of your childhoods, but. For myself, I know I had certain experiences in life which made abandonment feel much scarier or being, you know, trapped, quote unquote, in a relationship and things like that. I mean, I've done enough work on myself to know, oh, okay, I can trace this back to mommy, to daddy, to babysitter, etc. So therefore, some of the things you're describing, like if my girlfriend called me today, she's like, you know what, I'm taking on another lover. Like the feeling that I think that would probably produce in me would be sheer terror of abandonment. <laughs> Is that sheer terror worse because I have been abandoned a lot and also abandoned myself a lot in my earlier life, you know what I mean? Versus someone, um, would there be less triggers and easier to navigate this if someone had had a less tumultuous, less traumatic childhood per se? I would say so, but I also think that it's still going to bring up whatever is there. Like maybe it's abandonment for you, maybe it's self-worth for somebody else. You know, so it's going to bring that up. I'm similar to you. I have abandonment issues. I have self-worth issues. I have self-love issues. And so this brought up the full gamut for me. And if we're talking about attachment styles, I'm an anxious avoidant attachment style, you know? And so it's like, I have all, all of this beautiful kind of mess, but it made me who I am today. But it, I think whatever kind of trauma you have in your past, it's going to bring that up. If you were brought up in a community to where this was fully supported, it's go it's going to be easier because you're going to understand it and you've seen this as a part of your family. Yeah, I think you got to understand that it is like Whitney was saying, it's a universal stressor. So it's going to bring up what like everybody has something. You know, everybody has their home base trauma. You know, the thing that they've that they've gotten. Even if you have a relatively chill childhood, maybe one parent was emotionally unavailable, and you weren't really that aware of it. But actually, when you look at it, wow, that emotional unavailability over the extension of your entire childhood really made a strong traumatic impact, or at least conditioned you in a certain pattern. This is a universal stressor. It's going to bring whatever that was up, or maybe you weren't good enough for your dad, or maybe you know whatever the, whatever the thing was, or maybe your mom would shut off and on her love, or what, doesn't matter. Maybe your first girlfriend, maybe this, whatever it was. This is going to bring it out, and the deeper the trauma, the more pain you're going to feel, but also the more <laughs> right. the opportunity is for you to heal it. Right. because it brings it into the light and you're you're having to deal with it 
right in front of your face. And you can either, you can run from it from a while, for a while you can drink or, you know, snort some ketamine or do something and like kill the pain. And sometimes that, that is medicine. <laughs> sometimes that is medicine for a little while. Yeah, sometimes no, you it. need a break, but ultimately it's not going anywhere. It's still going to be there. It's not, you're just going to have to deal with it with a hangover when you finally decide to deal with it. And that's going to be even worse. Or you deal with it within that relationship or if you get out of that relationship, it's still going to be there. Yeah. So this is like your opportunity to be like, okay, what are my triggers in any relationship? This isn't just for open, any container. What are my triggers and how can I learn and grow and transcend them? Because I don't want this to continuously show up in, with my kids or with my family or with my friends or in my intimate relationships or my next intimate romantic relationship. This is really fascinating um, in context. It's so funny how the chronological order of recent shows I've done have all led into one another. It's fascinating. But one of the ones I did recently was with a guy named Mastin Kip. Um, who, God, if you guys ever have a chance, I yeah. don't know if he would fit. He was on, uh, I was on his show. Oh, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, a great guy. And, um, you know, his focus is like trauma awareness and trauma recovery. And in talking to him, I was like, okay, I'm, you know, we had like a two and a half, three hour podcast. And I started to see, oh, I'm connecting the dots. And I learned so much that I didn't know about myself and my own past. And toward the end, I'm like, okay, so the problem's very clear. Mastin, what's the solution? How do we fix this shit? And he's like, you fix it in relationship. Mm. I was like, oh my God. He goes, you, and exactly what you describe, you guys are describing. And whether or not you have sex with other people or not is irrelevant, but that the intimacy and in the open and honest vulnerability of saying, hey, I'm really terrified to tell you this, but this is what my truly radically honest experience is right now. Can you hold that? And in that, his his experience indicates that that is where the healing takes place. And that's what actually removes those triggers and the amygdala mm. from freaking out and firing adrenaline and cortisol through your fucking veins where you feel like you want to blow your head off, you know, mm -hmm. which is <laughs> where I've been brought to many times by that type of triggering reaction. So it's really, it's interesting to hear you guys describe that because it always harkens back to, you know, a, another guest point of view or experience. Mm -hmm. So it makes perfect sense what you're describing in that healing that's taking place, regardless of the severity and depth of your individual early life trauma, as you said, you're still gonna meet it where you are now, regardless of how much you had, how much has plant medicine use individually or collectively um, helped facilitate or, or, or deepen or speed up that healing of trauma through the work of the relationship? Well, the plant medicine use has been pretty essential, but it wasn't just plant medicine. It was also the utilization of MDMA, which is now, you know, probably nine months from, you know, compassionate care legalization because of the phase two clinical trials and the ability for it to alleviate uh, treatment resistant post-traumatic stress, cure post-traumatic stress. And so it's going to become a legalized treatment here pretty soon. but this type of relationship puts you in very traumatic situ situations, very charged situations. And, you know, Whitney and I have, I have had access to both uh, therapists with the experience and also, you know, the medicine that is of the highest quality um, that's allowed us really to drop in together, which was actually one of the original uses of post-traumatic, I mean, uh, of MDMA. Yeah, I've was heard in that. couples therapy. Yeah. And, that has been pretty essential in helping us come to truth because what it does is it creates a heightened sense of introspection where you're actually really able to see what's going on inside yourself, but also a deep sense of compassion and connection and safety and security so that you can receive the other person's truth as well. So not only can you find yours and have the courage to share yours, but you can also receive it from the other person without that kind of emotional you know, walls that get built up and the, the charge that comes from it. So it's really like lubricated our communication and, and our insight and clarified the, the mirror, polished the mirror, so to speak, polished the lens into our own heart and allowed us to communicate what we were really feeling. And I think, you know, that's probably been the most important tool um, in the plant medicine psychedelic sphere that we've used. Now the other stuff has been helpful as well, Wachuma and ayahuasca. You can see things about yourself more, more so that, that are really, a, you're able to then bring through the relationship. That but as far sense. as like us connecting, you know, a lot of the plant medicine is very 
It's very you <laughs> yeah. with the, it's you with the plant, but on yeah. the MD, in an MDMA in a ceremonial context, like it's you and your partner both opening your heart, evaporating all the armor, and then opening up your voice too, and and really communicating, and, and that's that's been incredibly helpful. That that actually makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> when I ask the question, I'm I'm picturing you two, you know, wandering off into the jungle or desert and doing ayahuasca mm-hmm. together and having a nice chat. And then as you're talking, I'm like, dude, you're not talking to anyone in ayahuasca. <laughs> I was like, that's the last thing I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm like, don't th- touch me. I yeah. don't know. <laughs> Get away <laughs> from me. Where am I? I'm, yeah, I'm talking to the ETs right now. Please Excuse don't me. Puke on me. <laughs> um, yeah, so that that's an interesting interesting um, um, perspective that the plant medicines is more about the individual work. Then you maybe perhaps reconvene with a deeper understanding of your own inner mm. working soul psyche etc but the mdma process together wow that's really cool i i've kind of forgot about the the fact that you know ecstasy for all you know to put, call it what some do um actually has a purpose other than going to a rave and yeah. like partying yeah. and being all hung over and i was actually talking to kyle about this in terms of the difference between really clean pharmaceutical mdma and like street pressed tablets that have a bunch of meth and whatever the fuck is in them and also the supplementation of 5 h what is it 5 HTP? 5 HTP, yeah. 5 htp and different things that can help support your neurotransmitters to go into it and come out of it without having that really depressing crash and stuff so it's exciting that um, miraculously that's actually kind of coming back into legality it's cool mm-hmm. yeah it's gonna it's gonna change the world i think we're on the precipice of the most important revolution in mental health that we've ever seen as a human in, in humankind and i think um it's going to be the legalization of psilocybin and mdma in a therapeutic context you see psilocybin coming down the pike too <clears throat> oh it's already through phase two really it's wow. our for the treatment resistant depression and anxiety wow. and the life care so that's that's maybe a year max behind mdma which should be you know again as i said as a compassionate care available in right. nine months but the the statistics and the research i mean you're showing cures of depression with a single one gram dose of psilocybin cures. We're not talking about like you have to take it every week. We're talking about cures. We're talking about cures with the MDMA treatment too. Three sessions, people with heavy treatment resistant post-traumatic stress cured. Like the cure paradigm in psychiatric medicine is not really there. It's like, here's your crutch. You need this to sleep, okay, you're on this. Oh, you're depressed, okay, you're on this. And oh, by the way, if you get off, eh, it's gonna be really fucked up. You might kill yourself. Experience, you know, you might have a really, you're gonna have a really fucking hard time. You know, like suicidality is a side effect of some of these crutches. Like you gotta like understand that these are very, very intense, intense, intense crutches. And it's not that you shouldn't use them, but just understand that they're very intense. But none of, not very few of these things is actually leading to a cure. It's a maintenance crutch. Whereas in the psychedelic medicine space with MDMA and psilocybin, we're seeing cures and that's why it's such a revolutionary thing it's not dependency on a substance to keep you in a certain state of mind it's you use this substance in the right setting with the right people with the right intention with the right clinicians and then your problem is gone in a lot of the cases and for mdma that's over 65 percent for psilocybin it's like over 80 percent in the phase two clinical trials that's crazy it's crazy it's really exciting it's exciting that is so cool yeah wow and 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 what about from your perspective on that thing and then we'll we'll close it out i mean uh subjectively on your end of it working with plant medicines individually what's that done for you and then collectively using the mdma in a therapeutic type setting yeah i couldn't agree more with ob at all you know for me the ayahuasca and wachuma and going down that those paths have been very internal it's very introspective where are these things coming from it goes back to that you know like i said earlier the commitment to yourself to look at your shadows and go into the deep waters as aubrey likes to say um so for me that's more of the plant medicines that's taking you into the deep waters looking at all of your shadows and once again that's where that commitment comes in to look at yourself and then through the mdma you know therapy use between us two it just it particularly for me allows me to take off my walls and take off my armors and and not be so afraid of abandonment and find that self-love for myself knowing that whatever comes out of this i have faith in that i'm going to be okay and that this is going to be you know if this is if all this does is promote growth between aubrey and i then it's a beautiful win and being under the influence of the MDMA helps that. 
and helps it, it gets that moving and, and afterwards I remember like the first few times or the first time I guess we did it I remember thinking like the next day oh shit what are those things that I said now I actually have to do them <laughs> you know um, but it's like that is truth like I was coming from a place of truth I was coming from a place with my lenses clear and saying like I want to show up in love for you and I want to be truthful about this because love is truth you going to your partner and speaking your truth is saying that I love you and I'm here for you um, and so it was just kind of like getting used to that and not being afraid of, okay, yeah, sure, you can see that person and then waking up the next day like, ah, what did I say and how am I gonna deal with this? Um, but it has been incredible. I, I honestly think it's one of the things that have kept us together. I'm not sure that we would be together without the utilization, medicinal u- utilization of that. How do you keep from smashing at the end of your therapy session if you're on MDMA? Oh, we do. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You do. You're like, um, doctor, that's can you the, leave the room the for reward? Because the, the processing can be very uncomfortable because especially if you have a truth gap that you're trying to bridge, right. that you were too afraid to say and the other person was too afraid to receive, you know, like, yeah, you might be on the one of the best feeling substances in the, ever created, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. It's still very uncomfortable and very communicative, and that can last two, four, six hours of just communication. But ultimately, the somatic reconnection, you know, sexually or just intimately, you're just holding each other. However, is you know really some of the sweetness that you get to close the close the space with. You know, like that's like. Ah, okay. Now let's just let the sweetness pour through our pores, so to speak. And and that's that's a really sweet way to kind of end it. Now obviously, you know, that's only available if you're in a relationship and doing this. If you're doing this with your homie, you know, or like you're you're providing for somebody, that's when you have to have boundaries, right? Like you can't offer this in a ceremonial context to somebody who you want to have sex with, hoping that at the end of the session you're going to have sex with them. That's really, that's really the dark side of shamanism, right? Yeah. Uh, so there say. needs to be a really yeah. like a hard, hard, <laughs> hard. That's, hard that's line. super dark. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that that's that's beautiful, man. Well, thank you guys so much for sharing your experience. I I, I mean I I always walk into any conversation with a totally open mind, but I, I have to admit, I was like, kind of like, these guys are fucking crazy. Like, <laughs> you, <laughs> you know, and a this, lot of other people, it's okay. This <laughs> sounds very fucking difficult. And it's really, really cool to hear your experience, you know, and, and um, it, it makes a lot of sense to me, you know, where you are. I mean, if, and, and again, like I'm on my own journey and I feel very happy with where I've arrived at this particular point, but it is really great to see people two people that have the courage to go into the deep water, you know, and are like, we're growing no matter what at all costs. And, and the growth ultimately is not only for yourself, but that's going to radiate then out into culture and society and the world at large and give more people the courage to look inside, whether that's in the context of a relationship or on their own. So kudos to you. Thank you so much for doing the show. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for, you know, making suggestion to bring Whitney on and do this. It's cool because we would have had a great time, but this is, completely unexpected topic and really a dynamic show. So I think people are really going to benefit. Yeah, from it. I think women also like to hear the female, the women's perspective of this, because so often when it comes to open or unconventional relationships, it's very male based and like, oh, he's just doing it so he can fuck a bunch of girls. Right. But it's right. like, no, 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 no. This is the, there's it's awesome for me, too. And I'm choosing to do this as well. And these are the lessons that I've learned. Yeah, it. a lot of female listeners right now are like, "Go, Whitney, go!" Uh, Whitney. <laughs> For sure. I just hope it like inspire. At the end of the day, it's like I hope it inspires people and women and men to just create whatever relationship that they want, um, and then outside of the relationship, just live as authentically as you possibly can. Amen, sister. I got one question for you, um, and this can be a, a quick answer if you can think of them not only on the topic of relationships or anything we've discussed, but for your life in general, who have been three teachers or teachings that have influenced you um, that our listeners might be able to go check out to learn more from? Well, I would say that the book that I'm reading right now, uh, Anthony DeMello's book, Awareness, it can be challenging because it's going to challenge your belief structure, but it's perhaps, and maybe it's just the time in my journey that I'm reading it and I'm open to that, but to me it's been the most important book that I've ever found. Whoa. Um, And it's not that long and it's incredibly comprehensive and he has a very challenging style. So, you know, it can be a little bit abrasive, but you know, if you can receive that and receive his style, uh, I think it's the most valuable book I've read. The other one for me is Paul Selig. 
um, who you've had yeah, a chance you to interview. That. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so his teachings, which are channel teachings, have been incredible. His latest book, Book of Freedom, I think is, uh, is out now. And then Beyond the Known is coming soon as well. Um, I did the intro to Beyond the Known, by the way. So oh, cool. people are interested in that. Cool. And then um, Don Miguel Ruiz is kind of like my first OG, the guy who took me on the path from the very beginning. And uh, his book, The Mastery of Love, is absolutely phenomenal. When you introduced me to Paul Selig and uh, that culminated in my interviewing him in New York, one of my questions for him, or for the guide specifically, because he was you know, channeling as he does in some interviews, is I said, would it serve the highest good for me to go to ayahuasca? Because I was tentatively planning a trip and he kind of giggled, you know, how sometimes he's like, <laughs> what's coming through is this. And he's sort of observing the message coming through. And I have to go back and listen to it to get the verbatim. But the essence was that you'd be fine if you didn't do it. But if you're courageous enough to go there, that it would benefit you. I was like, wow. shit. <laughs> yeah. I was like, thank you, guys. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thanks, you know? guys. And they're also sort of, you know, unblameable. If it didn't work out, I can't be like, hey, Paul. And he's like, it's the fucking guides. I don't <laughs> yeah. know. Talk to the guides. You know, hey, tune so back in. <laughs> guides, uh, what's your rebuttal? But, you know, and he was absolutely right. Everything that he or the guides said. So thanks for the introduction. It was yeah, a fascinating course. experience. Yeah. Okay. How about you? Well, he stole one of mine, which was Don Miguel Ruiz. Agreed there. Um, also, Wednesday Martin, and we know we've talked about her, but her book, Untrue, is all about female sexuality and sexuality in gener general and female infidelity. And before I even knew her, I read her book and it was just so eye-opening because for the first time, it felt like, oh my God, I'm not alone or I'm not weird for wanting to be with other people or there's not something wrong with me. And so I highly recommend that for any woman out there and men to read that book too, That's just what to I'm have thinking. an understanding. <laughs> yeah. Like I need to understand women better in general. I'll read that shit. Yeah, it's super interesting. And she's like witty and funny and she has all of these, you know, the scientific studies in there. So that was a huge one for me. And then I just got into Ram Dass recently, like late to the party, but I'm just like wide eyed star emoji eyes when it comes to Ram Dass. I'm reading his Polishing the Mirror. I already finished it. His Polishing the Mirror book. And that was, it's all about living from his, your spiritual heart and opening your heart, um, which is something I'm constantly, you know, doing my best to do. And so I highly recommend them. Awesome, man. Thank you so much, you guys. And where can people find you on respective websites, social media, et cetera? I am on Instagram and Twitter, and it's all the same. It's wit in love, W-H-I-T-N-L-O-V-E. Um, and then you can DM me or email me um, about any coaching or anything if you're interested in the podcast with Wednesday, I'll be out hopefully within the month. Awesome, so yeah. that should be, then your podcast will be out by the time this comes out, so cool. Cool. Rad. Yep, at Aubrey Marcus, that's uh, AubreyMarcus.com's my uh, website and you know, if you guys wanna peek into my inner workings every week, sign up for the newsletter. I don't really put out much more than just uh you know kind of my free writing rambling it's like thought. his diary <laughs> it's like a, it's like a it's like my <laughs> very public diary and whitney calls me mr newsletter sometimes because yeah because <laughs> half the time i know it's like about us and i have no idea what he's about to write and then i get the newsletter and i'm like whoa we just talked about that last night what you just gonna tell everybody right now right yeah like she'll, right, mr. We'll, newsletter. <laughs> we'll have talked about something it'll be tuesday and she'll go to sleep and uh, i haven't written it yet and it'll be tuesday night at midnight and i'll just bang it out and wake up in the morning like hey so the newsletter's going out it's my diary we, went out this morning <laughs> everything we talked about last night so that's good um <laughs> and then of course podcast aubrey marcus podcast and then for all the human optimization uh desires and needs and wants go to on it.com shout out to on it our location here for four of my austin podcasts so thanks to on it and um i use your stuff too man you yeah. know what i really like are those mct creamers mm, oh yeah. me too uh, bomb. put them in like teas well, yeah and coffee, so good because they, they taste like the old school like more toxic creamers you know what <laughs> i mean the hazelnut whatever yep. but they're you know they're actually good fats and not toxic so mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys have great stuff. Thank you. Thanks, brother. All right, you guys. Cheers. We're out. Bye. See ya. Peace.